What's up everyone? It's Matt Martin with The Grass Factor. Today I wanted to do a video on probably the most popular fertilizer in the United States right now that's available to homeowners. So today we're going to talk about the science behind Milorganite. Okay, so when we're talking about products like Milorganite, what we're talking about in its most basic form is a material, is a fertilizer referred to as a biosolid. The way biosolids are produced is facilities take in sewage from wastewater plants and then they anaerobically digest it. What this means is they do it in such a way that they do not expose it to oxygen. They do this through the addition of acetogenic and methogenic microbes and bacteria. And that's going to consume all that organic material. Then once all that material has been consumed, that means these microbes that are producing the acetic acids and methane are left foodless and then they ultimately die. That means at that point it's been completely anaerobically digested. This is when the biosolids are then ready to be prilled. Most biosolid production plants, what they do is through using the acidogenic and methogenic microbes, it, the byproduct is the production of methane gas and CO2, is that they'll use the methane gas as a syn gas to ultimately power the plant or generate electricity to sell back to municipalities or energy companies in the area. So <clears throat> what you're left with is this material that's been digested by these microbes and then it enters a rolling chamber. This rolling chamber is that you'll have the biosolids come in one way, they, they roll the this, this sludge and it produces these prills that come out on the other side. Once they come out on the other side, they're treated with an anti-dusting agent as well as iron. And what that's going to do is cut down, of course, on dust, and it will also give the prill crush strength. Then it's back for retail. Biosolids as a whole contain 60 to 65% organic matter. When they apply it to the soil, you know, typically most people think you're applying OM to the soil, your OM levels are going to increase. This is not the case. When you apply OM to the soil, it usually leads to an increase in microbial activity. They gravitate towards their food source. Then that applied OM will be digested by soil microbes, leaving you with a net point on your OM accumulation. You do not gain OM, you do not lose OM. In terms of long-term use, one thing to keep in mind is that biosolids, organic matter, is going to contain somewhere around 20 to 30 percent carbon. That's going to give you a good carbon to nitrogen ratio. And what it does actually increase, where it may not increase soil OM levels, it will increase soil carbon levels. This is going to decrease the bulk density of a soil and increase soil surface area, which ultimately affects the storage capacity of the soil. I've talked before about uh, soil surface area and how important that is and biosolids play into that because it is a carbon source that leads to an increase in soil surface area. This is one carbon source that you can use. Biosolids typically are going to increase exchangeable calcium uh, by weight. Biosolids are going to contain somewhere around 1.2% calcium. Uh, through extended use at extremely, extremely high rates, this can have a cumulative effect and begin to buffer pH, but I would never recommend anyone attempt to use biosolids as a pH buffer. It's not going to work. Trust me on that. One of the things that as biosolids break down, so it's only 60 to 65% organic matter. So a lot of that rest of that material is going to be accumulation of fatty acids, amino acids, which are going to be building blocks of proteins and paraffinic structures. So if you think of paraffin, it is a wax. So you're going to have these wax-like materials. Uh, this can have a soil structure effect in particular. If you're with sandy soils, it'll have an agglomeration effect uh, that can uh, allow things to hold onto or bind up in the soil, or it can have an agglomeration effect to allow things to move through easier. 
Um, it's one of the unique characteristics of applying soil carbon is that in clay soils it allows things to perk faster. In sandy soils it tends to help hold on and retain things. Again, biosolids is just another carbon source. One thing that you see about biosolids in particular uh, across the board, and this includes Milorganite, is that uh, the analysis is going to range from like a 640 to a 540 to a 320. And so basically you're almost applying a one to one ratio of N to P, P being phosphorus. Through repeated use, at high rates, year after year, you begin to have an accumulation effect of soil phosphorus. Soil phosphorus, in particular, coming from organic sources, tend to bind very aggressively with the soil. With it being bound up in the soil, oftentimes other nutrients that are metallic in nature have negatively charged ions. Iron, manganese, zinc can be tied up by this additional extra soil phosphorus and leave the soil deficient in those in terms of what's plant available. I want to talk about the nitrogen from biosolids. The majority of the nitrogen that's coming from biosolids are going to come through the digestive action of proteins, amines, nucleic acids, and the cellular waste. The soil microbes have to go through this very intensive digestive process of breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down. And what it leads to is roughly Ammonium nitrogen release, as we've talked about before, I explained uh, the importance of ammonium in the soil in the ammonium sulfate video, which is also known as NH4. Roughly, biosolids are going to contain around 3%. It may go from 2, may go up to 5% by weight of um, ammonium that occurs through that digestive process and as well as nitrate. That's going to be your NO3. This is going to be the one that's more uh, that will be easier subjected to leaching uh, your nitrate, your NO3 levels, and that makes up about a half percent by weight. So again, it's a pretty efficient nitrogen source. The increase in biosolid nitrogen concentration is usually a direct reflection of the, of the production process. These newer plant processes are much more efficient and they don't require as much heat, which usually leads to lower volatilization during the production process. So your end product typically has a higher end rate. Now, let's get into the science as far as what makes it practical, what makes it impractical. In terms of a cost per pound, I'll go ahead and throw up this chart here. <clears throat> so in this chart, I'm comparing Melorganite, assuming a cost of $8 a bag, Urea, assuming a $14 a bag, uh, a stabilized Urea, this is going to be a carbon stabilized Urea, and ammonium sulfate versus a, uh, a carbon stabilized ammonium sulfate. As you can see, Melorganite, in terms of cost comparison, you're at over $4.50 per pound of actual nitrogen. So per thousand square feet for the professionals, typically that's just how we price things is we price things per cost based on per thousand square feet. As lawn professionals, typically we will not be in business long if we continue to apply products that cost $4 per thousand square feet. Uh, because we could not make any money, nor could we compete against each other at that type price range. Ultimately, if we were left with only materials that cost $4 per thousand square feet starting tomorrow, we would no longer be in business. And that's why as professionals, we turn to things such as urea, stabilized urea, ammonium sulfate, and you know, stabilized ammonium sulfate. Let's talk about a little bit about what happens when the OM is broken down in the soil as it comes from biosolid. So the release of organic in from a biosolid is referred to as nitrogen mineralization. Biosolids, when they're applied, typically are going to mineralize about 3% of the total in. So if you apply a full pound of in from a biosolid, only 3% would be mineralized for quick uptake. Again, this is going to be temperature dependent, assuming you have the microbial activity to begin to break down the biosolids. In year one, you will typically see a 22 to 32% of applied in mineralize. So 
that first year, you're only going to release approximately one third of that applied in from that one pound application. The subsequent years, ultimately, you're going to lose a little bit to volatilization and just instability in the soil. And so year two, typically you'll get a 7% release followed by a 5% in year three and 3% in year four. Under incubation, so this would be perfect conditions for extreme microbial activity, um, they could mimic a 30 to 40% in release over a course of 16 weeks. That was the fastest that they could get the nitrogen to release under incubation. Again, that's 30 to 40% over 16 weeks. Now, in terms of actual efficiency, you would think an organic fertilizer is going to be extremely efficient. Yes, it is. However, again, even biosolids is relying on the mineralization to ammonium, ammonium and nitrate forms of nitrogen. So you still only get about a 60% efficiency for every one pound applied. So for every one pound of actual nitrogen you apply, you're only going to get about 0.6 pounds of actual nitrogen that positively impacts the plant. This would be more in line of what you would see with ammonium sulfate that's been stabilized or enhanced with a carbon source. Also, with each pound of N that's applied, almost a full pound of phosphorus is applied. In deficient situations, this is going to be fine. In normal to excessive situations, this can lead to accumulations. The added benefit of a biosolid versus just a traditional N fertilizer would be the additional micronutrients that are going to be involved in the biosolid. So you will have iron, manganese, zinc, molybdenum, copper, some trace heavy metals, and they typically occur at very low rates that are not going to be negatively accumulate into the soil. That being said, one of the most important ones would be calcium. Uh, again, with that 1.2% calcium, that is a positive thing to have in the soil. However, if we look at the cost of actually applying or supplementing micronutrients to our standard uh, fertilizer method, so that could be a carbon stabilized ammonium sulfate or a carbon stabilized urea, it would still be significantly cheaper. You're only adding cents per thousand square feet, maybe a dime, maybe 22 cents, maybe 23 cents per thousand square feet to supplement additional calcium, iron, manganese, zinc, molybdenum, copper. And so your cost per thousand may go from a dollar 20 to a dollar 40, or it may go from 75 cents to 95 cents per thousand square feet. Whereas with malorganite, you're still going to be locked in at that approximation of $4.50 per thousand square feet. Morganite is fine uh, and it's great for its simplicity. Uh, you know, they have their four application deadline in the spring and then I don't, I don't know what the four days are, but they have their four applications where you apply a pound of N or something of the sort. And it's a very simple way to introduce you into fertilizing turf grass. And it's a relatively safe way to fertilize turf grass in terms of salt indexes. You don't have to worry about it. It's really low in salt index. It's pretty predictable in the sense that you're not going to burn up your yard with malorganite no matter how you apply it. If you do go out and you do spill it, you know, it's still going to look nice. Uh, it's not going to kill your grass. However, it is expensive and it takes a long time. So when I say expensive, it's very expensive. It's going to be four times the cost of anything else we have on the market. So from a professional standpoint, it prices us out of the market to be able to incorporate it into our programs at its current cost. Even if you were to drop that bag cost to $5 a bag or $3 a bag, we're still going to be in excess of $2.50 per thousand square feet per pound of in, which ultimately, again, still prices us out of the market. Biosolids are going to be extremely dependent on soil temperatures and ambient air temperatures in order to guarantee release. And the reason this is, is that you have to have microbial activity and extreme digestive activity to take place in order to release those nutrients that are bound up in the organic matter component of malorganite. 
So in adverse cultural conditions, so this would be cold or extreme heat, you'll get a decrease in microbial activity, therefore a decrease in inactivity, an increase in volatilization, a decrease in nitrogen efficiency. The other limiting factor would be no control over your phosphorus levels. And in some parts of the country, this is not going to be an issue because you may be deficient, you may be in blackout areas, and you may only be able to apply organic forms of P. So coastal areas of the transition zone uh, and you know much of the Midwest that have P deficiencies, you know, this would be good for you in a short term. However, again, repeated applications at your high P rates typically will end up lead to diminishing returns. Uh, and this may happen over a three to four year period. This may happen over a five to six year period. Again, it's going to be determined by your initial baseline at the time you start. Then in terms of it actually being a balanced fertilizer, it's almost balanced. It does not offer any potassium. Now, again, according to the research from Pace Turf that has established turf grass limits to still perform optimally, very little soil K is necessary for turf grass to perform well. However, some K is better than none, and a bunch is not better than some. Unfortunately, Milorganite offers none. So, if you're already in K-deficient situations, Milorganite is not going to offer anything to correct that. So if you're suffering from a decrease in turf grass performance or uh, ability to resist stresses, whether that be environmental or cultural, Milorganite is not going to help you in that instance because it's not going to offer any K. So, Again, as kind of a recap, Milorganite is a great starting point for a homeowner that wants to get into the business or a homeowner that wants to do something positively to correct the aesthetics of their turf grass. It's a great starting point. Uh, it does something beneficial to establish a more positive growing environment by supplying OM and increased microbial activity. Uh, it, even though it sells itself as being a complete fertilizer, it is not complete. Again, the issues you may run into long-term with XSP, the absence of potassium long-term will begin to show diminishing returns without K supplementation or a lack of supplementation of fertilizers that contain P. So again, I would call it a good starting point, but anyone who takes their lawn serious or takes turf grass serious, they will be left with a lawn that will have additional needs to help it achieve that next level. All right, y'all, I hope you enjoyed this video today. Again, just wanted to make the point that Milorganite is a great starting point for fertilizer. However, in terms of being able to take your lawn to the next level, uh, it is lacking in certain areas. You know, it's one of the, the great things I like about you know, watching Alan Haynes' videos is that, yes, he's a big proponent of Milorganite. However, he uses things like starter fertilizers that are going to give him K sources, or he also recommends the Ringer uh, that has, you know, potassium sulfate in it. So, again, it's not a one-and-done type product, uh, but it is a good starting point. So, anyway, y'all, again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do me a favor, click the subscribe button. If you have any questions or comments, either send me an email at thegrassfactor at gmail.com or comment down below, and I'll get to you as soon as I can. All right, y'all, have a good one. Take it easy.